natural, the recent advances in natural language processing and AI, what prospects do you see for SLA? Well, as I mentioned, the advances in natural language processing and AI, well, they may be useful for some purposes, by just tell us absolutely nothing about language. Uh, if they happen to be useful for some purpose, say Google Translate, live translation, transcription, SLA, that's fine. You use whatever's useful. But uh, if you're interested in the nature of language, the nature of cognition, human cognitive processes, uh, these, this work just tells you basically nothing for the reasons that I mentioned. Does the human brain contain a limited set of constraints for organizing language. Undoubtedly it does. We don't know very much about it because we don't know very much about the human brain. It's a very hard topic to study. Uh, the, uh, the brain altogether is a hard topic to study, even for tiny organisms. So if you take a, an ant, which has a brain the size of a, a tiny a minute brain, you need a microscope to see it. Uh, we have no idea how it carries out highly complex computations that humans can't carry out. So the desert ants in my backyard can navigate in a way that a human can't. They use computations that are inaccessible to us. We have to duplicate it with complicated instruments. Even the ant brain is very hard to understand. Human brain is much harder because uh, we cannot do experiments, the kind of experiments that immediately come to mind. You can't do them for ethical reasons. So we happen to know a fair amount about the human visual system. But that's from experiments with cats and monkeys, which rightly or wrongly we've allowed ourselves to carry out. Uh, and they have about the same visual system they do. But you can't do that for language because there's no other organism. No other organism has even the rudiments of human language. So there's nobody to study. And you can't study the human brain for ethical reasons. So it's a very difficult topic. Nevertheless, there are some achievements. One of the most important ones, in fact, has to do with structure dependence, what I mentioned, the property I mentioned. There is uh, research created by uh, Andrea Moro, fine linguist in Italy, Milan research group, uh, which I was able to show that uh, here's the paradigm they used. Uh, they took subjects, uh, say, whose native language was German, and they gave them two kinds of invented languages. One invented language was based on an existing language that they didn't know, maybe Italian. The other database was a very simple language which used principles that you don't have in language, like linear order. So a language in which negation is the third word of a sentence. Very simple to work out. Well, it turns out when the subjects were given an inventive language based on an actual language, the, norm, the language areas of the brain, language dedicated areas of the brain function normally. When they were given an invented language that violated structure dependence, even with trivial algorithms, there was diffuse activity of the brain. The language areas were not activated. They solved it as a puzzle. Well, that uh, tells you that the brain, it tells you something about what we expect to be true, that the brain is structured in such a way as to be available 
available for language the way it is. It sets conditions on what language must be. One of them are the conditions that conform to the fundamental principle of structure dependence. There are a few other things like this, which are quite interesting, but it's a hard topic.